realistic glows around the edges of the illuminated crescent shapes of these planets. I like that alternate reality humanity was allowed to try to stave off destruction with some renewable energy with some nuclear plants, but based on the windmills being in the piles of garbage, I'm guessing it was a tad too late. Put on your Sunday clothes, there's lots of world out there. This opening. Put on your Sunday clothes from Hello Dolly. A very early 20th century song about looking beyond one city but starting us in space. Not even sure where our galaxy is at first. Two things couldn't be further apart and yet it creates this awe and immediately connects us to our home, Earth, which is excellent because we're about to see that it's become unrecognizable at the very least satellite wise. But then the happy-go-lucky feeling fades away as it gets to the ground. It's diegetic so Wally is still bopping along but our top-down POV is shifted to the stark truth. And, even if Wally doesn't know it yet, getting a little electro peck from Eve becomes a main goal for him. Hey, his track is already beat up. Oh my goodness, the shallow folk is trying to follow the cockroach. I highly recommend watching this movie with subtitles on if you never have. I always had the feeling it was something like a grunt of acknowledgement, but huh. Adds even more relatable humanity to Wally, and once you see what he and Eve are saying, you really start to hear it as well. And after our upbeat show tune that was incongruous with the visuals but aligned with our main character's disposition, Thomas Newman's score brings us down to reality with some minor key heart plucking that finally sets the stage for what's going on here. Show tunes are gone because humans are gone. What a freaking opening to a Pixar movie. Andrew Stanton claims he has no message in here. I mean, who could have predicted our own B&L taking over everything? Well, by and large. It's not like they're the government. Yet. So, why is Wally still alive? Well, there's your answer. He's been repairing himself with other units' parts. We also have to assume that through some glitch, he achieves sentience, which is why he cares enough to repair himself. With our all-access hover chairs, even Grandma can join the fun. There's no need to walk. Huh, so that's how it starts. Sorry, Grandma, we might need to leave you behind to prevent this eventuality. Because at BNL, space is the final fun here. <laughs> yes, you give me Fred Willard and he gives me buns. Show of hands, how many times watching this did it take for you to catch what Wally stood for? Because it took me actually looking for stuff and writing this to notice. Oof, so Rex is just trapped there for eternity with no humans to play with him? Also Mike with nobody to do stand up for? And clocks and hula bobblers, Lady Liberty torches and David the Gnome? <laughs> Every bit of misused human artifacts is perfect. Basketball globe, trash can lid, hat, spork, confusion, toaster VHS storage? And the nesting dolls are with the bowling pins. Just when he thought he had a lot of stuff before. And a dino cool lighter. Also, if you're wondering how Wally runs everything, probably has something to do with all those batteries. Now might be a good time to point out how absolutely gorgeous this film is. The scuff marks and worn paint on every part of Wally's metal body, the way the glass of his eyes bends the image, the way the light bounces off the scrapes and the tips of his fingers, claws, clamps. It's been said before, but there's so little dialogue in this opening, and we still get a full picture of who Wally is. Mindless robots don't notice the stars above them and then turn on music to set the mood for themselves, questioning what's beyond their trash heap. Nor do they gently rock themselves to sleep. When in doubt, make your robot drunk slash hungover, it'll always kill. I'm a PC! I pass no judgment on a potentially centuries old battery that goes from three to zero bars overnight, even though if I had to guess I'd say Wally leaving his music playing all night probably had something to do with it, but either way there's continuity with it since he has four bars when we first see him and then three bars before bed, and then back to nine after a full charge. <laughs> it just doesn't get any better than Wally's reaction to mundane things. And there's your first Jude win, gets a laugh from him every time. <laughs> space thruster shadowing that Sandra can't compete with. And now for an action scene. And if you always thought it was a weird cheat to have the red laser running all over the place and not just at the center of the circle of dots to begin with, the ship was looking for a landing zone that was flat enough to land on. That's why it scans in this spiral. About as convincing as a cardboard box. And you thought Wally was the only Apple product. While you're enjoying the most romantic piece of music ever written for two robots, take a little notice of the light ring circling Eve's neck. I mean, really, you can hear it so clearly once the subtitles are on. 
while we're talking about pretty sounds, Eve's sound design compared to Wally's is another contrast between the two. Everything about Eve is smooth, rounded, and shiny, while Wally is rough, foxy, and disheveled. His sound design is always retro compared to hers. She's a top-of-the-line, newly-released smartphone, and he's a rotary phone. Or like, two cans and a string, maybe. Also, she has a tad more firepower than Wally. Also, another robot that has so much personality with not many words. Generosity? Ha! <laughs> he used a Luxo lamp for an arm. I'll say that robot protagonists keep the Wily e. Coyote laws of nature making sense? Never any life in the Pizza Planet truck. Hmm. So even prior to leaving Earth, it looks like they were doing passenger flights to space and then passengers floated back to Earth in capsules? Fun fact, Eve only gets stuck to the magnet because her power source powers up the magnet. There's a perpetual energy meme in there somewhere. But just like with the bulb, she's an energy source just by proximity. The crew wasn't 100% sure, but I'm 90% sure her last foreign language before English is Hatties. Listen to that and tell me it's not something Bib Fortuna would say. Doesn't get any better than that. <sighs> Never mind. <gasps> While I chuckle at Eve breaking Wally's stuff, I can't help but notice how every light, every little detail is reflected in her outer shell. And you more clearly see the servo in her arm, always moving around, and frame by frame later you can see the same in her head. Also dancing? Oh. <laughs> ah, the moment we learn that those wily e. coyote laws of nature don't always protect Wally, which makes it Eve's gotta fix Wally at risk losing him shadowing. You could say his love for her burns bright? Mm, flirting? Based on that response, I'd say even Eve didn't know what her directive was, which is why she just said, Classified. And Wally does the only thing he knows works for him, a little vitamin D. These heat waves coming off the top of the truck, such a cool effect that I wish was less topical. And a Wally taking care of a comatose Eve montage is the fastest way to absolutely crush it, Pong. Even the way each action scene is shot is unique and entertaining. So, do we do we need to file this under unnecessary risks taken by Wally due to his unimpeded devotion to realism? Or actually, is it Wally plus hanging on exterior of high-speed moving vehicle equals win? How about both? So it's only B and L and Russia left in the space race, or is that just an old Sputnik? <laughs> Nothing can shake that little boy's love. It's just another romantic night of taking in the stars with Eva. <laughs> so that's why a Dyson Sphere would work so well. This silly robot cartoon has no business being this stunning. Wait, is Lindsay's book a sequel to Wally? -E? JK, JK. But a Cinema Wins Word of the Week will actually shed some light on why the ship name ties into the story. Eh, you get it? No escape. Huh, even this ship has a name and it's Arv. <laughs> Mo feels like a good time to say that Ben Burt, you know the guy who made R2-D2 sound the way he does, is amazing and created thousands of sounds for this movie. <laughs> I love that even Wally knows he's dirty. Other than making his tracks last longer, he also takes them off before going into his home to keep the dirt out. Again, one third of the way through this movie and the only real human voices we've heard have been pre-recordings and we get another character whose deal we know immediately. He likes things clean. Black? I don't want to do that. Well, then what do you want to do? <sighs> Living the dream. Don't even have to turn your head to keep up with friends. <laughs> ah, you old rats and burger pratball. <sighs> uh, John. I can't think of anything better than pizza, ice cream, and egg in a cup. Try blue. It's the new red. Yeah, let's hope so. Because of light lightsaber colors, you know. <laughs> His keyboard is just ones and zeros. So they all served as captain for over 120 years, some as many as 140, meaning humans are now living way longer, and have evolved to carry more adipose and less bone. Bigger arteries, maybe? Regenerative food buffet. Well, that's not replicators, that sounds like waste recycling. So it's a poop joke if you really think about it. Or, oh no, it's, it's worse, isn't it? It's not waste recycling, is it? <laughs> Love goggles, otherwise known as soft focus, or even better, a Vaseline lens. <laughs> Wally's always so helpful. Wally. Politeness. Oh. 
Everywhere Wally goes, he changes the world. So much happens in the background of this movie. Defibrillator robot lighting test dummies on fire. Eve not trusting the carousel of compartments or just the trash blowing in the wind behind Wally. Wow. Aww, <laughs> more flirting. Man, that, uh, that is a thing I absolutely did at eight or nine years old to much older girls. That's a weird thing to leave in. <laughs> Wally's alive! If you're wondering how the plants stayed alive in space, Eve is the extraterrestrial vegetation evaluator, meaning she'd have all the necessary tools to save a plant, even CO2. <laughs> Hugging. Oh, what? You didn't think there was gonna be a robot dance scene in this movie giving you all the feels? Inverting thruster engines so they appear like fountains? Everybody down, hey. And they both instantly died of heart attacks after 700 years of no human to human contact. Wait, where did all the baby- The fine hold down. A social gathering at which lively dancing would take place. Not exactly what you'd expect the captain to talk to mother about, but she can't always be diverting ships to distress calls. Usually I'd leave an alien reference to stand alone, but I just think it's really cool that the star of the movie that was one of the inspirations for all ship computers got to be a ship's computer. Just warms the cockles of my heart. Divine dancing. How about this motif from the first time Wally sees Eve flying used again since that was the start of his infatuation with her. And now he's on cloud nebula 9. No splashing, no diving. Ah. And they both instantly died of electrocution when the robot fell in the pool. <laughs> I'm just going to start winning the moments that make us awe. Another subtitle I never knew about. Sir, I insist you give me the plan. Look, I have sympathy for Gladys if that creepy pasta thing has any truth to it, but Otto is just meaner Hal. Two laps around the ship's jogging track. We have a jogging track? Even Hal told Dave about the track. And the axiom you will survive. I don't want to survive! I want to live! There's your message. Only one little dude's been living around here. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it works for Ant-Man. Wallas are terrifying. Making new friends. Eve is finally choosing Wally over everything else, even when Wally's actually the bright one for once. Oh, and he kept the lighter with it because she was so enthralled by it. But uh, out of all the new tech in this movie, the perpetual and eternal lighter fluid is what I want explained. We all know if you let that thing sit for two weeks, it's not gonna light. Oh my. Clear. Teamwork. It's like Titanic, but slower and probably softer because of the sub-Earth gravity. God, get ready to have some kids. Saving the babies. <laughs> Oh man, that screech is heart-wrenching. She really loves that little dingus. <laughs> don't laugh at him. You don't laugh at the monkey using the tool. These are babies' first steps since they're all giant babies. Also, that reminds me that this is actually the second 2001 reference, which makes even more sense now. The same Richard Strauss piece was used for the Captain's Morning Rundown as the introduction to the space station. That one was a little more sarcastic than the other Strauss, Johann Strauss's piece used, which is equally a step forward in evolution for them. You are relieved of duty. So now he's Manuel? Operate Manuel. <laughs> More teamwork. Really joining the annals of sci-fi with a space-time, stretchy, wetchy, hyper-light warp jump. Oh my gosh, he never moved that whole time because Wally told him to stay. It's a happy ending version of Jurassic Bark, uncalled for, narrator, uncalled for. And they all instantly died of sunburn, heat exhaustion, gravity crushing their feeble bones, you name it, after 700 years of vacation, gravity, temperature control, and being indoors permanently. Fulfillment of that Chekhov's eye from earlier. And look, we, we appreciate the help, but you had to blow up his roof? Man, there's something in here about our jobs crushing the things we care about, but I'm gonna ignore that and say how sad it is to see Wally gone. His collections, the things that made it clear he was unique, now trash to him. Wally! Wally! Tears. Tears for Eve's loss and more tears for Wally's cold dead eyes. 
So, I sort of like the idea that Wally's sentience is actually a malfunction. Something must have shorted out a long time ago, a lightning strike, or maybe as the last robot on Earth, he just evolved, which is really just trial and error anyway. But maybe Wally questions everything and feels emotions because he's not a perfect robot, much in the same way that humans are not perfect, nor are our emotions neat and tidy. So this little shock maybe shorts out whatever was inhibiting all of Wally's memories and he comes back. Even Wally? Okay. Now the tears. Yeah. And he finally gets that requited love we all so desperately need. Farming! You kids are gonna- Okay, but these kids clearly only saw the first half of Idiocracy if what I think is in the cup is in that cup. And just in case you thought I was serious about them all dying, we get to see them thrive through our own history's different versions of recording history, from cave drawings to technical sketches and paintings. You're looking at a Kalima in your future, just saying. <laughs> LED would have been more energy efficient, but it's cool. Wally literally can't help himself from helping others. Wally is one of the best Pixar movies to date, maybe ever. Every detail is stunning. It boggles the mind that this was made in 2008 because visually, pretty much everything holds up today. And every little piece is so well thought out. For obvious starters, the ship's autopilot is an actual wheel. Also, as one of the few characters who could be considered the villain, he's the only character without a human voice actor. I guess it depends on how you classify Ben Burtt's contributions to things, but Otto is voiced by Macintalk, and that has the effect of making him less sentient than the rest. He was really just following programming, so he's not even really a villain. Everything about Eve is fantastic, her cat-like movements when she laughs, her arc of directive-driven to Wally lover, but I specifically love how she spins her own arm around like a revolver after firing it? How about these movements from Mo, as if he's stretching and shaking off the shackles after leaving his predetermined path? And then we have Wally, one of the most emotive characters Pixar has ever created, and as we've already covered, he has like a couple dozen lines in the movie, and most are huh or whoa, but I bet you didn't notice that he doesn't have elbows, or something you've probably just never said aloud, he's just eyes. He doesn't have a mouth or nose or face, he's just a pair of binoculars. Even number five had a light mouth. Or maybe, maybe that wasn't until he started calling himself Johnny Five. Anyway, decisions like that astound me when I think about the writers agreeing in the planning stage. So, Eve will just be a black screen with two blue circles? Auto a red light? And this guy? This guy is just a flashing light. And yet, each one has so much personality. Speaking of details, the segment that's quickly becoming my favorite part of part two videos, things I missed or got wrong from your comments under part one. Eve couldn't wait two more seconds to make sure Wally was okay, and that's why she blew up his roof. The mice are called Remies in honor of Ratatouille's Remy. Otto inches closer to each captain in the photos as if his power and influence is growing. One more comment from Philip Kramer that's a fun theory he came up with about Wally's sentience and personality. That they're not an accident and it was a form of evolution based on more and more efficient methods of completing his directive. You can read his full comment over there, it's pinned, but basically understanding a piece of trash's function would aid Wally in cataloging things in a way that would make compaction easier, make his towers more stable, and by grouping things by functions could save space in his memory. It's fun to think about, and he goes into more detail, that's just my quick synopsis. Okay, there are two other main things I want to talk about today. The first is something the movie does amazingly, better than most, and the other is something it dips its toe into but sort of flubs it a little from my perspective. But beyond just the absence of spoken words, the sheer lack of exposition is astounding. The last two acts have some information given from the captain, but his dialogue almost further sets Eve and Wally apart as two characters on their own adventure. As if not even we, the audience, can truly appreciate their relationship and understanding of one another. And that's the first thing I want to talk about. You probably didn't expect a love story from the mostly silent robot movie, but it's portrayed as this unstoppable force for Wally. I mean, Love Conquers All isn't anything new, but like, Wally was just doing his thing, right? Hauling cube, making cubes, and then the love of his life drops into his lap. He only goes into space to make sure Eve is okay, and then everything he does throughout the movie is to get closer to her and make sure her directive is fulfilled. In the process of chasing love, he has a positive impact on almost everyone he meets. Wally adds something new to the lives of everyone he comes across. A hand wave, a sense of fulfillment, freedom. The misfit robots that had no purpose because they couldn't complete their main functions are pivotal at the end in helping Wally and Eve fulfill their directive. The biggest one is that he brings humanity back. I made a joke about this being the dream, but oh my goodness is it not really. Wally gave these people the gift of inconvenience, which can be a hard pill to swallow, but love is better than convenience. 
Much has been said about how Wally is a role reversal for humans and robots. Wally has individuality and personality, while the humans have none. They have no purpose and do what they're told. When Wally is rebooted, that was his death scene, and he was exactly like the humans. Get it? They were dead. I wanna live! Humanity had been trapped in space for centuries, and at least during the few days that we view the Axiom, humans aren't questioning a thing. They're on their little blue lines to go wherever they take them. They seem to be allowed to make decisions, but multiple generations have just accepted this reality. Even when the captain speaks of the one thing I get to do on this ship, he's still literally on the course laid out for him by the ship. And then we have Wally back on Earth shaping his own world. He was still completing his task, but he had a personal life, things he enjoyed, and his entrance into the Axiom's world upended everything. So it ended up being a beautiful love story about two robots that saved humanity. The other thing I want to talk about is the framing of this story. This is the part that I've rewritten a few times because I have a lot of thoughts, but I, I don't think most of them are all that helpful. Andrew Stanton really wanted to stay neutral and claims there isn't an intended message, which is totally fine. It's just that in doing so, I think he actually created one of the worst dystopias ever. And it wasn't really fixed by the end? More or less, by and large, gets a pass. You know, the giant corporation slash government that has to be directly responsible for the Earth's toxicity? I know, I hear you, chicken, egg, supply, demand. If we didn't consume, they wouldn't create, but we know that's not the whole picture. Piles of trash aren't Earth's actual problem, and they never will be. Even if they were, the CEO slash president? King? Fred Willard says it's the rising toxicity that forced humans to leave. But back to trash. Consumerism as a whole is a problem, it just has much more to do with the byproducts of manufacturing than the trash created. Even the waste products and runoff that end up in waterways are a bigger problem for humans than a mountain of tin cans. And the general idea of Star Trek, but commodified, is again a terrifying dystopia. Like it's post-scarcity, but one entity now owns everything? That's way grimmer than actual dystopian stories. We're just seeing the in-between time when company is waiting something out. Do, do they own the passengers? Did they have to sign their lives away? Either that or every single person on the Axiom, all 600,000 of them, are wealthy beyond our wildest imaginations, and billions of poor people are still on Earth somewhere. Corporations aren't generally known for giving away free 700-year-long stays in space. And their entire culture on the Axiom is shaped around advertisement and selling things, so there's an exchange of money happening. But I'm, I'm getting away from myself again here. It's not like this is the first time consumerism has been lambasted, probably best by the original Dawn of the Dead. And I'll never say don't challenge it, so even if it's buried under, well, trash, there is still a solid message in Wally about taking care of our Earth. In Stanton's effort to maintain neutrality, I have to give him credit because there's no preachy message, which may have a larger impact in the long run. You don't want to live next to a mountain of trash, right? And a good place to start with younger generations is to teach them about their own personal responsibility. Hopefully it convinces them to use their voices and votes. And the thing is, you don't even need to accept the reality of climate change to not want this future. And even though I take issue with the it's you looking at your screen that's the real problem actually message, without the end of the world stuff, there is a fear that society and culture could decay into a screen-obsessed mass of people following their blue lines to a... Well, it's still not an early grave. So, look at the stars, hold hands, help those around you. I'm very good with all of that. It's also totally fine to ignore all that because the writers deliberately left it out so that we'd focus on the beautiful love story. And that's what I'll do when I watch it with Jude. If he learns to recycle and overthrow the corporatocracy in the process, all the better. And again, next week will be that fighty one I was talking about last week. up the mess while you're away. Operation Cleanup has failed.